Good morning. Uh, this morning is Trinity Sunday, and so we will be thinking about that mystery of God's triune nature. One of my uh, favorite Trinity Sunday stories is from one of our synod's books on the d different doctrines of the Bible. And on the Trinity, it says there was an uh, abbey in North England where the, the abbot preached a sermon every Sunday, except on Trinity Sunday, he said, owing to the difficulty of the subject. So he just didn't preach anything that Sunday. It was, but that's, the Trinity is difficult. It challenges us. Uh, but at the same time, we can't help but marvel at who God is, at what he's done for us. And so today, let us marvel at who our God is. We may not understand, but we can believe in this God who has saved us. To worship our God, let's use the order of service in our worship folder. And so we will begin with the opening hymn, hymn number 194, Oh, That I Had a Thousand Voices. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. 
In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in mercy cleanse our hearts and lips that free from doubt and fear we may ever worship you, one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit living and reigning now and forever. Please be seated. For our first lesson, we hear the word of God recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 6, the first eight verses. The lesson will serve as our sermon text this morning. In the lesson... Isaiah has a vision into heaven. He sees God. He is overwhelmed by what he sees. But God offered him comfort, the comfort of forgiveness. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. We'll continue by singing the first two stanzas of hymn 239.
hear God's word from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. You will hear of all three members of the Trinity in this lesson. All three united in one thing, your salvation, working so that you can live forever in the glory of heaven. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of God. And we'll continue with stanzas three and four of hymn 239. Please stand for the gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson for this morning is recorded for us in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. This is the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. In the lesson, Jesus doesn't discuss or try to explain the doctrine of the Trinity, but he does talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each working, again, for our salvation. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do, not, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We will continue with hymn 195.
Grace and mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God which we will consider is the first lesson we had from this morning recorded for us in Isaiah chapter 6. In the name of our triune God, brothers and sisters in Lord in uh, brothers and sisters in the faith. I suspect like you, I frequently do things that Quite frankly, I don't understand how they work. For example, I don't honestly understand how my cell phone works. I, I have no idea. Transmits data and pictures and not just voices, but the actual sound of a person's voice. It, it, it actually sounds like that person. I, I have no idea how that technology works. And it, it works wherever I go. I got a phone call once after I passed a sign in Utah that said next gas station 108 miles or something like that. I'm literally out in the middle of nowhere and my phone rings. And I have a conversation with a person. I don't know how that technology works. Or a couple of years ago, I went to Israel and my, on my flight home I had a layover in Germany. And as I was sitting in the airport and I was just looking out the window, an Airbus A380 started rolling towards me. This is the, the biggest passenger plane they make. And as I saw it rolling towards me, I thought, it's amazing something that big can move, let alone that they can get it in the air. Well, as I watched this plane taxiing through the airport, it suddenly made a left turn in front of me and pulled into my gate. It was my ride home. And you know what I did? Even though I don't understand how they can get something that big in the air, you know what I did when they said it was time to get on board? I got on board. Didn't even think about it, didn't worry about it. Somebody who knew how to make planes fly had figured it out. I wasn't concerned. And so I crawled on board this gigantic plane, just like I do when my cell phone rings. I don't know how it's working, and I can talk to my parents who are on the other side of the continents. But it's ringing. I'll answer it. I don't understand how it works, but... I'm more than happy to make use of it. You may understand how cell phones or better understand how planes work than I do, but I bet there's something out there. You just, you just really don't understand how it works, and it doesn't bother you. You just make use of it. You use those, those inventions that are out there even though you can't explain them, even though you could never make one yourself. If we struggle to understand some of the things that have been made in this world, some of the machines and inventions that are out there, imagine understanding and explaining God. How do we explain the existence of God, the, the, the true nature of God? St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, was was overwhelmed as he thought about God's nature. And, and he said this, In short, human speech labors under a great inadequacy. Nevertheless, we speak of three persons. Not that that adequately expresses the truth, but so as not to pass over the matter in complete silence. For the ineffable grandeur of the subject cannot be explained by this term. Or Martin Luther was once noted to say that we use the word Trinity even though the word doesn't really make a lot of sense. So in other words, we've come up with these terms that we'll use. Let's just all agree to use the word Trinity, to use the words or word persons, but they don't really adequately explain God's nature. But we'll just all agree that's the best we can come up with. So we'll use those words. On Trinity Sunday, we have to be confronted with the, the divine, impossible math of God's existence. That with God, one plus one plus one equals one, not three. That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not each a third of God or a part of God, but they are each completely God. And that math just doesn't work out. We've come up with all sorts of illustrations to try and help us understand it, but the fact of the matter is every one of them misses the point somehow 
We use a triangle or a, a clover leaf, but that would suggest that the Father's a third God, just one side of the triangle. That's, that doesn't quite explain it fully. Or sometimes people talk about how water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, but the water molecules can only be one at a time. But God's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's three, yet he's one. We are confronted with an impossible mystery when we think about the Trinity. And the true test of whether or not you, you understand what the Bible says about God's nature, about his triune nature, the true test remains that you can admit that you don't understand it. Because if you claim you understand it, I can guarantee you've got it messed up somehow. God's existence is so magnificent, so great, that we just can't fully understand it. But our inability to understand God's existence shouldn't bother us. It doesn't bother me when my cell phone rings. It doesn't bother me when they tell me to get on a gigantic airplane. It shouldn't bother me when I'm told that God is beyond my understanding. For the God who made this world, the God, the true God, exists in a way that we just can't fully understand. But although I may not understand how he exists, I can understand what he does. And when I understand what he does and what he wants for me, I'm filled with, with praise, filled with faith, with confidence in this God. Because I know that what he wants is for me to be saved. The same thing he wants for you. That you would know him as the God who will save you. Our text is from Isaiah chapter 6. And, and Isaiah was overwhelmed when he saw God. When he witnessed what was happening in heaven. He heard and saw the angels who were singing praises to God. And his response, Isaiah said, woe to me. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah did not react by saying, oh, wow, isn't God cool? This is neat. Isaiah was overwhelmed by his own failures. His failures compared to the perfection, the holiness of God, overwhelmed him. He was struck by the reality of his sin. One of the side effects of trying to make God small and understandable, someone we can comprehend, is that we oftentimes have to make our sins small and acceptable. Let's consider what Isaiah saw. Sin is not acceptable in God's presence. The mighty angels sing to God, holy, 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 shaking heaven itself. They are so glorious. But those angels hide their faces in humility before God. For they know how great God is. We dare not think that our sins are small, no big deal. Sin is an offense in the, in the presence of a perfect and holy God. Big sins are offensive, the ones that make it on the news, but so are the little sins that are committed, that don't make it onto the news or into the newspaper. The selfishness and the, the greed that no one can ever actually see, well, except God, those are sins. They offend him, deeply offend God. Our lack of faith, our failure to pray to him, or even the things we don't do that we should have done. Maybe didn't even notice that we could have done them, but we didn't. Those are failures that anger God, that the, the perfect God cannot stand. When Isaiah was overwhelmed by what he saw, woe to me, 
when Isaiah was expecting God to be angry with him, then he saw what God does. We see it too. God sent an angel to assure Isaiah that his sin was forgiven. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. That's what God does. In unnecessary and unearned grace, God forgives. He washes away all of our sins so that we can stand in his presence. God's own son would come into the world and take away those sins. He would suffer and he would die so that every one of our sins would be washed away. The horrible punishment that we deserved, that Isaiah knew he deserved, that all of us deserve, that punishment was placed onto Jesus Christ and we are forgiven. That's what God does. He forgives people. And so while well, on Trinity Sunday, we have to spend a few moments thinking about the impossible math of God's existence. Let's not get bogged down by that. And let's not let the devil use it as a trick that he loves to use to trick us, to think that God has to be understandable to me in order for me to believe in him. You don't need to understand God's existence. God wants you to believe in him as the one who has taken away your sins. Jesus could not have more clearly testified about that in our gospel lesson. That what God wants for you is that you would believe in his son. That you would believe in Jesus. And through faith in him, not because of what you've done, not because you're better than anyone else, but simply through faith, God washes away all your sins. He purifies you so that you can stand in his presence. God makes you, as we heard in our second lesson from Romans chapter 8, God makes you into one of his children, an heir, part of his family. You are one who will share in his glory. That's what God does. You may not understand how he does it, why he does it, how he exists, but you can understand this. God has saved you. God has come into the world so that you can live in the comfort and the peace of knowing that you are forever his child. God never asked you to understand him, to explain him. God wants you to believe in him. He wants you to believe that the promises that he makes will come true. The promise that Jesus makes that whoever believes will be saved is true. God wants you to believe all his promises. That when he speaks, you know it will happen. And so you can believe all of them. You can believe with King Hezekiah. After he almost died, Hezekiah said this, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. You can believe that God is always working for your good. You can believe the promise of the psalmist uh, in Psalm 25. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Even though we can't explain it, and even though the world would like to say that, that what we believe is, is silly and ridiculous, and we might think the world thinks we're, we should be shamed, we're not. We believe the promise of God. There's no shame in believing in God, no matter what the world says. For God will save us. He will work in our lives for our good. He will, he will be with us for eternity, for he will save us. And knowing that that's what God does, we can respond as Isaiah did. Here am I. Send me. You may not be called to be a prophet like Isaiah was, but nonetheless, God has given you gifts and opportunities to serve him. And rather than ignore those, make excuses for those so that you can indulge yourself, as you, 
as you look at the grace of God, the magnificent forgiveness that God has for you, the eternal plans that God has for you to be in his presence, as you look at what God has done for you, you can say, here am I. Send me. Send me into the part of the world where I live, Lord, to serve the people who live around me. Keep your eyes open for those moments, those opportunities to join Isaiah in serving the God who has saved you. At Arlington National Cemetery in, in Washington, D.C., they have the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. If you've ever had the opportunity to visit it, it's, it's an impressive sight. And do you know that every day since 1937, every minute since 1937, there has been a guard standing at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. They don't call them guards, they call them sentinels. They've stood out there in blizzards. There's even one recorded time when they stood out there in a hurricane. And of course, you know why they do it. They do it to honor the soldiers who've given their lives to protect our nation and protect our freedom. It's worth it to them to stand in sometimes ridiculous conditions to honor those soldiers. That's what we do on Memorial Day, right? We, we honor those who have protected us. If those soldiers deserve respect, and they do, how much more the God who has saved us for eternity, the God who has sent his son into the world to die for us, how much more does that God deserve our respect and our faith that we would trust in him? We know he will never leave us. And the fact is, we may not understand how he does what he does or how he is what he is. But nevertheless, we can believe. We can believe the promises. We can live with confidence and joy that the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will not leave us. The triune God, through faith in Jesus Christ who died and rose for us, that God will take us to be in heaven one day. The triune God will be with us when things are happening in life that we don't want, that we can't control. He will use them for our good. He will. That's what he does. He keeps his promises. You may not understand everything that God does. Quite frankly, you don't need to. Don't feel bad if you don't. But you know, you know his grace. And so trust in him. Trust in him as the triune God, the unexplainable God who has saved you. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue on pages 12 and 13 in the worship folder. Uh, singing the hymn, Here Am I, Lord, a hymn that's based on uh, the final verse of our text, of our sermon text.
For our confession of faith this morning, we will use uh, the first half of the Athanasian Creed, the part of the Creed that deals with the triune nature of God. As someone once said, the, the Athanasian Creed is correct in what it says about the triune nature of God only because everything it says, it immediately unsays. It's what makes it true. It's confusing. And the Creed bears that out for us. We will read it responsibly as it's printed in your worship folder. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship God in the three persons, and three persons in one God, without mixing the persons, or dividing the divine For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is distinct. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. Yet they are not three who are eternal. But there is one who is eternal, just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite. But there is one who is uncreated, and one who is infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet they are not three who are almighty, but there is one who is almighty. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet they are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually to be God and Lord, the Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but is begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. And within this Trinity, None comes before or after. None is greater or inferior. But all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Please stand for our prayers. Lord of hosts, your ways are beyond our understanding and your judgments are unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing insight into the depths of your riches. Give us insight into your wisdom and knowledge that we may glorify you forever and trust in you at all times. Lord of hosts, you gave your only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so we pray that you would bless the work of missionaries as they carry this gospel to the ends of the earth, that many may hear of your love that you've had for the world through your son and be saved through faith in him. Lord of hosts, may we continually grow in the joy of our baptism as you have given us new life. May we have joy and confidence as we cling to your promises. Lord God, we give thanks for those who have served our nation through their military service. And we remember with gratitude those who gave their lives for us and for the cause of freedom. Help us to honor their sacrifice by using our liberty with responsibility. Keep safe all who travel. Bless our nation with responsible citizens who eagerly serve one another 
and who are honest in all their dealings. Lord of hosts, we ask that you would uphold all those who are suffering from any illness or trial in life, that since you are at their right, their right hand, they would know that they cannot be shaken, gladden their hearts, cause them to rejoice even in times of trouble as they trust that all your promises will be fulfilled. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We will continue with hymn 753, Father God of grace, you knew us.
please stand. Oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We close with hymn 326. Good morning again. There are three pages of announcements for you to read this morning. I'm not going to read all of them to you, but please make sure you take time to look at them. I got to highlight a couple of them. Uh, ser uh, service times will change come July 4th, so about a month away, uh, where we will have services on Sunday mornings at 8 and 1030 with Bible class in between. Please, please make note of that. Uh, just today, we'll be having a door offering for the Lutheran Military Support Group, a group that works with Wells members who serve in the military and veterans. There'll be a, a plate in the back for you if you'd like to participate in that uh, door offering. Uh, I'm doing the, my uh, visits again, uh, home visits with you. If, you're, if I haven't visited with you and you'd like for me to, sign up sheet on the back table. Uh, please find a date that would work for you and sign up for that. And then finally note that Miss Jackson's farewell party will be on uh, Saturday, July 24th here at church. But since you came to this service, you get a preview. You get to say something to her because she's actually here this morning. So you can say good morning to her. Uh, but we'll have that farewell for her in, in a couple of weeks there in July.